the city was much bombed by the Germans and has been rather boringly rebuilt. The cathedral was much bombed too, but has been skillfully set to rights. You'd hardly know anything had happened. Mercifully, two of the cathedral's chief treasures, the medieval stained glass in the east window and the huge wooden 14th century bishop's throne, were packed away during the war and reassembled after. Let's enter the cathedral from the west. The whole of this front was once, it said, painted in colours. Bishop Grandison, who died in 1369, wrote to his friend Pope John XXII, saying he would make Exeter surpass every church of its kind in England and Wales. The bishop's likeness is on the gable of the west front, where he symbolises St Peter, the cathedral's patron. In front of and below this gable is a stone screen pierced by the huge west window. In front of and below this is yet another stone screen, filled with figures of kings, apostles, saints and angels in lively postures, and a little chapel is wedged into this west wall. Devon pigs and boars and sheep are carved round these western doors, and in the entrance to one of them there's a pair of stone oxen looking out of baskets, part of a carving of the manger. Push open the low entrance door, and there, surely the most splendid length of 14th century stone vaulting anywhere. Clustered columns of grey-green Purbeck marble support arches with many mouldings. Above these are a low triforium and tall clear story buttressed by the vaulted aisles. The bombing blew out much Victorian stained glass and now we can see the whole delicacy of nave, aisles, transept crossings and choir, cream and grey in pearly daylight. And there, perfectly poised in the middle distance, is a pierced stone screen with Carolean paintings on it and supporting the 17th century dark wood organ case whose pipes you'll hear tonight. Screen and organ save this cathedral from being a long vaulted tunnel. They turn it into a forest avenue of stone with another glade beyond. And beyond this, behind the high altar and under the 14th century glass of the east window with its deep blues, reds and yellows, there are twin arches springing from a central clustered column. And behind them, we see the square east end and beyond that, the length of the Lady Chapel. A man of genius redesigned the Norman Cathedral of Exeter in the 14th century. Most of our cathedrals are lofty and narrow, but Exeter is different. It's long and low and sturdy west country. It's all worked out with as mathematical a precision as is the astronomical clock in the north transept. Stone balances stone, side chapel corresponds to side chapel in either aisle, transept to transept, window to window, monument to monument. It's twins all the way down from west to east. But for all its precision, symmetry and harmony of parts, Exeter isn't austere and forbidding. It's warm, warm from oil-fired gurney stoves and friendly, and full of people and full of ornament. West countrymen have always been good at carving stone and wood, and there's much in this way that you can see at Exeter. Let me tell you the story of two stone corbels in the nave. There was once a humble member of a monastery who couldn't sing in tune. So when offices were sung, he used to go down into the crypt and do a tumbling act in front of a statue of Our Lady. He was found out and reported to the abbot. But the abbot was a wise man and he realized this humble person was doing his best to praise God in his own funny way and he allowed him to go on. So there on one corbel you see an angel playing a fiddle and the tumbler upside down above him and on the opposite wall is the figure of the virgin and child. The riches of Exeter, the painted chapter house roof, the effigies, 
chantry chapels, tombs of Elizabethan bigwigs and elegant Georgian tablets. There isn't time to tell you of them. Come instead into the most splendid part of all, the choir. The singers are sitting in Sir Gilbert Scott's dark canopied stalls. Light has faded from the broad east window. The wooden steeple of the bishop's throne soars into the half-light. Royalist Stuart Exeter, which objected to William of Orange sitting in that throne and being declared king. Royalist Exeter, here we are. And the music begins with three pieces from the early 1600s. Hosanna to the Son of David by Wilkes, a voluntary for double organ by John Lugg, who was organist here from 1602 to 1645, and Magnificat Anima Mea by Hugh Facey, who was for a short while one of Lugg's singers.
Now two pieces by Samuel Sebastian Wesley, who came to Exeter from Hereford as organist in 1835. We hear first his anthem, Wash Me Throughly From My Wickedness.
The other piece by Wesley is for the organ. The organ at Exeter is a most commanding sight from the west, but the east side is even more beautiful and more authentically preserved. There you will see the date 1665 carved on it. It's one of the oldest organ cases in the country, and it was considered John Luce Moore's finest achievement, and his memorial stone near the entrance to the south aisle of the choir includes the words, May this majestic organ placed nearby be a perpetual monument of his art and genius. However, none of Lusmore's pipes remain. The instrument has had several rebuilds, and the most recent was last year by Harrison and Harrison of Durham, 300 years after the organ's original installation. The people of Exeter are once again proud of their cathedral organ, and the first recital on the new instrument packed the whole cathedral. The piece by Wesley, which Lionel Dacres plays now, is a set of variations on the chimes of the church bells at Holesworthy, which is in North Devon.
now three anthems composed at different times in this century. Turn back, O man, by host. Give us the wings of faith by Sir Ernest Bullock, who was organist here in the 1920s. And finally, O Lord, the maker of all things by John Joubert.
That recorded program was broadcast in our weekly series, Britain's Cathedrals and Their Music. It came from Exeter, where the cathedral choir was accompanied by the assistant organist Christopher Gower and conducted by the organist and master of the choristers, Lionel Dakers, who also played the organ solos. Unfortunately, because of time, we couldn't include the Stanford work, which was mentioned in the advertised program, and the correct name of the composer of the Magnificat is Hugh Facey. And the program was introduced by John Betjeman, who next Friday will be introducing the program from St Albans.